Hey everyone, 8 Bishop here. Today I want to do a more introductory level video and just go over how to build a deck. And I'm not going to just show you how to put cards in your deck, I'm more going to discuss curve, um, kind of objectives for your deck, that kind of thing, things to think about when you're going into your deck build. Um, in some ways a lot, a lot like other TCGs where you just want to curve out and make sure you're optimizing your mana, but at the same time, um, knowing that your deck is a 12 card deck and you're going to see on average nine of those cards without anything to draw you cards um is a factor to keep in mind because you have more room to play with combos um but should also make sure your deck has at least one extra win condition because <clears throat> three cards in your deck you aren't going to see well that doesn't seem like a large number uh, 3 out of 12 is still 25% of your deck, so you do want to make sure your deck can function without a single card, but <coughs> it's okay to have a deck that really likes Nova, for example, um, but how does that deck win without the Nova? So, um, let's go ahead and go into collection really quick, and, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, uh, this deck here titled uh, Lockout as a kind of example deck <clears throat> really quickly. And you'll see here that um, this particular deck, uh, I'm not playing any six drops and I'm only playing two one drops. Um, and then I have a couple five drops. But now in this case, I am playing this as a more controlling style deck. And if I'm playing one card on curb, then I'm doing fine. But um, <clears throat> To make sure that I hit the curve is actually why I'm running with Quicksilver. And uh, the reason I stopped by this deck is I knew for a fact I was running Quicksilver in this. This is a very important fixer card. Uh, if you don't want to play a uh, low curve, uh, if you want to play a more expensive curve, but you want to make sure that you have actual options in the early game consistently, you really want to play your fixer cards. There are two notable fixers on the low end of it for the game. You have Quicksilver here, and then this particular deck isn't playing... Um, the two drop fixer but there is also domino available which is the same effect as quicksilver except in this case you always draw this card on turn two and not before it quicksilver is you always get this in your opening hand so the drawback of playing those is you aren't going to be drawing your combo pieces and stuff the upside though is that you're always going to have a turn one and turn two play so if you're playing a deck that has like a ton of three drops and on I strongly recommend doing something like Quicksilver and Domino, and um, that's really where uh, this idea comes in to begin with. Um, let me go ahead and just make a deck slot really quick. This is a deck I don't really play anymore because it's kind of a starter deck. Okay, now we have a deck slot here. So let's just take a look at this hypothetical um, deck that wants to play a more... Um, controlling late game with like a lot more impact cards but wants to make sure you're hitting curve so what you're going to do is the first step that i like to take is just identify if there's any like low costs that you want to play but just really quickly what we're going to do is we're going to add the quicksilver to our deck and we're going to add um the domino to our deck Now, a deck that's playing both of these is likely going to be a deck that is running a lot of three drops and on. I do recommend that you run at least one other two drop in the deck, if not a couple other two drops, even if you don't want to want run one drop in your deck, because it will help fill out your curve on those rounds where you're not able to spend an even amount of mana on three, right? Because on turn four, you're going to want two two drops or a three drop and a one drop to spend your mana most efficiently, or a four drop. <coughs> And so, this kind of deck is the kind of deck that I'd expect you to be running very heavy end things. And that's where it gets kind of tricky, too. Something like Ironheart, you want an early curve for, right? Because this card rewards you for having units in play. So you either want a lot of early curve cards, or a lot of cards that are going to put extra things out, like Mysterio, um, Mr. Sinister, that kind of thing. Um, well, let's just do a hypothetical thing really quick. That This deck's whole idea is that it plays a lot of three drops um, and more expensive type things, and that these are here to make sure you have a turn one and turn two play. Whereas I build this is kind of a tempo deck, 
Um, and we're not going to build it with any theme in mind, just looking at mana curve. Because um, obviously when you're building themes, the themes are going to pick cards for you, and then you're going to go in and fill in your curve afterwards. And I'll do an example of that right after this, probably. But for now, we're going to say pick kind of generically good things that fit into the curve that we're discussing, right? <clears throat> so, like, Mr. Fantastic's great staple card, Cosmo's a really good anti-meta card, and um, a good starting point, in, unless we determine that Cosmo's got a harder deck more than our opponents. <coughs> um, Hulkbuster is often a very good card here, um, but we're going to hold off on that because... We don't know how much clutter our deck has yet. If we're playing one card a turn, Hulkbuster's not going to be as important for us. Um, we know that Wave is almost a must here. Even if we end up not playing a lot of expensive cards, if most of our deck is like three costs, um, Wave is more likely to hurt our opponents than hurt us. Uh, obviously, if you're worried against playing again, uh, if you're worried against, <laughs> sorry, if you're worried about playing against um, something that's more top end. Then you hold the wave, you're not going to be playing the wave um, unless you need it for something top end yourself, but that's besides the point. Um, so you could, you know, grab something like the Shang-Chi to get that in your deck as well. Uh, keep in mind, though, that with this only destroying things with 9 or more power, unless we're in a top end meta, this isn't as powerful. And uh, while Nova's the meta, it's a little bit harder to play the Shang-Chi because they will occasionally have a unit big enough, but. Um, the consistency of that and where it's going to be is a little bit harder to predict, and you want to be playing your Shang Chi's earlier when you're able to at least. Um, it's a really good like anti Namor card, for example. Um, and Namor is a great card to just kind of throw in this this list for now while we're like figuring it out. Uh, White Queen is also a pretty good card to throw in while figuring it out. It can uh, help you figure out what your opponent is playing. It can give you an extra card of advantage. Uh, all that's quite good. Um, Hobgoblin can be hard to play, but I really like it in a list like this where you're just kind of filling out curve. Um, so for now, we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, Crossbows is an example of a card you don't want to play when you're playing a, um, a slower deck because the odds of you being able to meet his conditions are a lot lower. He fits much better in an aggro deck as a top end card. Um, I personally think decks like this that like to play one powerful card a turn, uh, run Professor X and Claw really well. That's why, um my list that's running the Quicksilver is doing that. Um, Professor X is a very specific theme, though, so we're just going to grab the claw for now. And then we go and we look, and we're like, we have a couple good ongoing effects. Maybe we grab Dawn Slot. And now we ha kind of have our, our end game, right? We're like, okay, cool, claw plus Onslaught, that's 10 stats to so a thing on the right, plus 10 stats to wherever they're at. That's a pretty good little two card combo if you get mr fantastic it's even a little bit better you have 12 power in center and then you're giving 10 to right and uh or not 10 to right um 14 to right and then um four to left that's pretty good for three card commitment right so now we can go in and we can see that we still have two spots for two more cards um we have only three three drops right now um and then a couple four drops and then a couple five and one six drop right now so you have to ask yourself at this point, do you want to play more expensive cards and more things to take advantage of the fact you're running expensive cards? Um, and you start asking, like, okay, do I play Jubilee to cheat out some of my cards? Um, but the tricky thing with Jubilee with, like, this layout is you care a little bit more about where your stuff's positioned. <clears throat> so you just have to kind of start evaluating from there what's your deck's goal, what's it trying to do to win, that kind of thing, right? And so I personally think that what this deck is doing at this point is... Most of the time, you're hoping to do the Claw plus Onslaught to win one of two spaces almost for sure. Namor gives you a lot of power in that right spot if you're supporting it. Um, and so you're more just looking for things that you can do proactively earlier in the game. And um, that's where you can look back and go, okay, cool. I actually do have room for a couple more cheap cards. Let's grab a Nightcrawler because <laughs> it's always good to have a Nightcrawler available for locations that... <laughs> <clears throat> locations that don't um, allow you to play units directly to it or have um, risks to doing so, like Danger Room. Um, now, keep in mind, we could also do something like Sunspot and say, like, oh, we're okay skipping turns. And if we want to do the okay, we're okay with skipping turns, then maybe we do something like Sunspot and we do something 
like um, the Infinite, which wants you to skip a turn. <clears throat> Uh, but if we were doing the infinite, we probably wouldn't be looking at doing something like wave, because wave and infinite actually pair very poorly together. <clears throat> so you have to kind of like consider how many anti synergies you're willing to run, and um, make sure that you're not over committing to anti synergies. Because like I could do infinite plus wave, but um, I've done it in decks before. Um, specifically some running Jubilee, and that's the only reason I would run them both in the same deck is when I'm running Jubilee, because they're both enablers in different contexts. Um, but it gets a little bit trickier the more anti-synergy you're playing, and since I'm not playing other stuff to cheese out the Infinite, I don't think I want to run it and run Wave, and I think I'm pretty happy to have Wave in this list because of my Hobgoblin pairing, and maybe even getting an early Claw or Onslaught. <clears throat> So then we go back up, and we look, and <clears throat> maybe we add another 2-drop, because we only have one 2-drop right now. And that's another curve we'd be happy to have. And then we ask, like, can we reliably have an empty hand? Because if so, strong guy's pretty good. This deck doesn't run anything to discard from our hand, and uh, that may not be quite good enough, right? Now, we want to run something like Mysterio. A lot of times the answer is yes, but if we want to play Namor, Mysterio is anti-synergy for us here. So now we keep looking, and we keep going, uh, and we have a few pretty good options here. So we can go for armor, because that's going to be anti-meta. You know that it's another card that can counter things like um, Carnage and Nova and such. Um, you can go for something like Okoye, which is to give extra stats to all of your cards, but that has anti-synergy with Hobgoblin. Um, Angela is just a generically powerful card. But knowing we aren't going to play a lot of cards per location, it's not as valuable to us. And you kind of just go through this like checks and balance list of like, what are the different things I'm looking to do in my deck? And I think at this point, my deck is very clearly like a kind of like controlling deck that wants to disrupt what my opponent is doing and then just win a couple of locations um, through attrition, um, through things like Hobgoblin plus Namor or name more supported by claw and that kind of thing and with that being said i think we would take the armor because this is clearly a deck that um wants to counter the metagame a little bit and isn't super negatively affected by that cosmo is really only going to interfere with our wave um and our hobgoblin and uh white queen but that's three cards um and we really just play Cosmo in a location, and realistically, <clears throat> that location can often just be um, wherever your claw is going to go down, um, because that's extra backup to protect your claw from, like, Enchantress. <coughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of just, that was starting a deck with a concept, and building around a curve and finding a concept as we go. Um, now, that's not how I recommend building a deck. I recommend building a deck with a theme already in mind because it gives you a little bit more purpose but you can build it either way and when you're first starting off maybe you don't have enough cards of a given theme so building by the curve is the better option for you but once you start having a bigger collection i recommend going for your theme and building your curve around your theme so <clears throat> sorry um voices having issues today don't know what's up with that maybe i just need to drink more water just a second <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, real quick, we're going to do one more, but we're going to make this one a theme today. We're going to go in and we're going to say, like, this is the stuff I want to use, and then from there, we're going to build a deck around it. Um, let's go ahead and just, because it's already on the screen, we're going to say that this deck is a strong guy deck. We know at the end of the game, we want strong guy to reliably be able to go off, which means that we either want a low curve of cards or the ability to discard cards. Um, or some combination thereof. So we're going to go ahead and start on the low end of the, um, of our mana curve. And knowing that we're playing strong guy, we don't want to overcommit to a high end mana curve. We want to make sure that if we have multiple high end cards, we have discard cards. Um, and if we don't have discard cards, then our high end cards are very limited so that the odds of us having a card in our hand at the end of the game are significantly reduced. Um, so with that being said, we know Sunspot is unlikely to be powerful with strong guy because unless we're playing a very, very low curve deck and then just not having cards to play. Um, Sunspot 
isn't going to be triggering its ability very often. Uh, we know the hood isn't going to synergize well with strong guy because it puts a card in our hand. And it's only a one cost card, so there's still room for it if we're going to play like a destruction package. Uh, but we're going to start with just the obvious synergy um, or like default staple cards that you'd like to see. Um, with the same notion of like something that gives you card advantage is great, but with a strong guy, you don't necessarily want that. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab a couple cards that disrupt our opponents instead of giving us card advantage. I'll throw a Nightcrawler in. Nightcrawler is one of those one costs I almost always go to because um, it's just one of the best one drops in the game. Uh, a great thing to ask yourself when deck building too is, uh, is this deck easily disrupted by a location or two? And if the answer is yes, you want, you should heavily consider Scarlet Witch as a uh, thing to try to save your deck. A um, good example is like um, the movement deck that I have a lot of fun with that I like, uh, that I named Bust a Move. Uh, that deck is very easily disrupted by locations. So that's one of its big weak points. And I've had uh, to waffle on this notion of fitting Scarlet Witch in or not because I think when a location ruins a game for me, Scarlet Witch does have a good opportunity of fixing it. But because the location disruption rate is so high for that deck, um, it lowers the value a little bit for me. Uh, with that same notion in mind, sometimes Uwaru is a really good card to play if you expect a location to hurt you. Um, but more for if you're positioning early, which is once again a notion that the Bust and Move deck does. Um, for those of you who didn't watch the Bust and Move video, it's a it's a deck that uses things like Multiple Man and uh, Vulture, it moves your units around and tries to duplicate your Multiple Man and make your Vulture bigger. And because there are a lot of locations that restrict when you can play on them or what you can play on them or if you can play on them at all, um, that deck is very susceptible to locations getting in the way of its synergies, especially because um, only having two locations to play on, it gets cluttered really, really fast, and a lot of your synergy cards, you want to be able to very specifically move one thing. Um, so the deck is fun, but not reliable, <clears throat> um, just for context for people. Um, so for now, we have three one-drops. It's a really good spot to stop. Um, you really only need, like, two to three of each mana cost that you're running, at least initially. Um, we know that we're going to want to do a uh, lower cost top end for Strong Guy. So that's something still to keep in mind. <coughs> um, knowing that Angela tends to be a great card with Strong Guy because you know you're going to be playing a lot of low cost units. Um, I also really like. Um, where are you? Do, do, do. Uh, Sentinel is one of the worst cards to play with Strong Guy uh, for obvious reasons because. It just constantly keeps your hand full unless you discard the Sentinel from your hand. Um, obviously, the Devil Source stuff doesn't go well with Strong Guy. Um, Gambit is not a bad card to play with Strong Guy. If you're going to play a discard card, this is one that destroys something at random. The drawback to this is it is more expensive. Um, <clears throat> I was just to say Bishop, though. Uh, Bishop, Angela, and Strong Guy are kind of like this three card package that really build this great tempo deck. <clears throat> I I personally like playing this deck just like a really good low curve aggro deck. And we're gonna do something like Okoye <clears throat> and Nakia. And now that we have those duplicating our stats, <clears throat> or not duplicating our stats, but giving us extra stats, um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna throw Mr. Sinister in. Uh, if Mr. Sinister gets hit by either of these things, then he, then his clone is gonna be um Increase in stats as well. So if we actually get lucky enough to do a Nikoye and a Nakia hit on a Mr. Sinister, we get 12 points of stats for uh, two, which is quite good. Um, now, often when I play Strong Guy, I will play a Nova package, um, but I don't want every video to be, look, this is how you play Nova, because that'd be boring. Um, so we're going to go ahead and skip a Nova package here. And what we're, we're going to just do is determine if we want to actually play anything higher top end than the three mana we're currently at, or if we'd like to stick with like a three mana thing. Um, I think it's pretty reasonable to go up to four mana, um, but not exceed four mana more than one time if you aren't running discard cards. Uh, if you're running at least a card that can discard, you can get away with like two cards with four mana. I have a different deck built that is similar to this. And my anti-meta deck, or one of my anti-meta decks, I don't know if it's the anti-meta deck I featured now that I think about it, um, 
plays two four costs, uh, but it does play a blade to help with uh, the discarding. I think so. I think what we're going to do is we're fitting the name more, and then we're only going to be looking at more three costs, two costs, and one costs. So let's go ahead and look for things that are going to innately synergize with things like Okoye and Nakia. Um, doo -doo -doo. So we go ahead and we go through here. Uh, Scorpion is an option that we could potentially have just to disrupt our opponent's hands. Um, but so far this deck isn't too disrupting. Our Korg and our Iceman are our most disrupting things. Um, we do know that Killmonger could be very strong against um, a Nova deck. If they set up Nova early, but people who play Nova well typically won't do that. Um, Storm is actually a pretty interesting option here because we can use Storm to um, lock down a location that like has a bishop or a strong guy on it, and uh, we're actually very likely to be able to do something with that. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna grab the Storm here, and that gives us a kind of cool lockdown option. And then we need one more card, and. Um, now that we're looking at this, if we wind up with something like Storm, we might wind up um, in a situation where our hand still is a little cluttered because we either don't want to play something because of Namor being there, or just run out of space in general. So we might want to play like a card that discards something, and at that point the question is, do you want something uh, low curve, like a Blade, um, or a little bit more expensive? Um, and so we kind of have to look at our mana curve here. And we see that um, we have quite a few four drop, or we have four two drops, we have three one drops, we have three three drops. Um, so, you know, we have to keep in mind where are the odds of us hitting our curves. But also, like, something like Blade, a lot of time you don't want to play it at the end of the game anyway. And that's, that's something to keep in mind as well. And I think the really important factor for us here is we want to make sure that we're likely to be able to play two cards in one turn. And since Namor is the only four cards in our deck, it means that we can safely even take Gambit and put Gambit in the deck, because our worst case scenario is we play Gambit plus another three drop and we discard the Namor, which would let us get three cards out of our hand in the last turn. <coughs> and anything else but Namor can just be played with Gambit. And this gives us kind of our strong guy deck. And there we go. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to hop into one game for it. Um, I'm sure this video is already getting a little long because um, we've discussed quite a bit. So feel free to watch the match or not. We're just kind of testing out the deck. This is part of the deck building process too. You want to see how it feels in the curve and everything. Uh, I'll tell you right now, this is similar enough to some other decks I've played. I'm feeling pretty confident. Um, <clears throat> also keep in mind when you're deck building, um, you should always be willing to adjust a little bit for um, whatever the location of the week is, if there's a location of the week, that kind of thing. Uh, plus one energy this turn, so we can actually rush out something. Uh, knowing that we have something like Namor to take advantage of the Onslaught Citadel, we don't have to be worried about that. We don't know what this blind location is. Let's just go ahead and storm it. And force our opponent to play there or um, or be done. Because um, with an Iron Fist, they're kind of signaling to us that they're using uh, movement strategies. And um, this kind of thing can be very disruptive to a movement strategy. Um, now, it is awkward that we can't apply a lot of stats here this round. Um, the most stats we can actually get is if we do Angela plus Iceman. Uh, so we're just going to actually do Okoye plus Iceman. Get that Koye out as early as possible. And they actually just give me the flooded location. So um, we're in a pretty good spot right now. And then Namor is going to be a pretty heavy contest to this spot. Uh, we do have to determine, though, is Nakia a better thing to do on curve now? Because it will actually power up our Namor. Um, and so I think that's actually going to be our plan here, is we're going to play the Nokia first. <clears throat> Knowing that we want Namor to be alone, it's a very high value play for us to do Nokia first. And see, this is where we um, gain the question, um, do we try to play on curve more reliably? Because we could play the Gambit here, but then we give up the Namor. 
And uh, so it can still get tricky to have the empty hand. We do lose uh, the ongoing doubling, but I think we're pretty okay on stats here. Let's see. Yeah, so at this point, we'll snap two, because um, we can give up five power here, but gain eight power back, right? So we just do this, which should already be enough stats to claim that, and then in addition to that, Gambit could potentially take out one of these two stats. I'm pretty sure we just win this, because uh, their board is full. And there we go. And this is a quick example. And like, obviously I didn't actually hit strong guy, but the deck was kind of playing towards that goal and was just kind of a tempo deck along the way. So yeah, that's basic deck building. Um, I hope you found something helpful about that. Um, one last thing I should go over is just that there is a tab you can search for um, um, different keywords as well as search by costs, search by if you own it or not, not that you can craft in this at the moment, or just actually search typing in a keyword, but um, pretty sure you can search by name. Yeah, so there's my Electras. You can also um, hide the variants to make it less clutter. Uh, if I forgot anything or <clears throat> you found anything particularly helpful or less helpful, let me know. I can maybe make a more concise video down the road. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully um, something about it was helpful. Also, sorry if that showed up on the recording thing. I uh, forgot that was open and tabbed over it. <clears throat>